Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session. On behalf of everyone at RevIO, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I'm Delaney Dabkowski, RevIO's Field Marketing Manager. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, audio will automatically come in through your computer speakers. Second, a recorded version of this webinar will be emailed to you within two days. Third, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end of the event, so please submit your questions via the Zoom control panel at any point during the live presentation. For those of you just joining us, welcome. Today, Brent Phillips, VP of Marketing from Paya, will be discussing how to optimize the digital customer experience through integrated payments. Brent Phillips leads end-to-end -end marketing programs designed to foster differentiated brand development, thought leadership, and pipeline acceleration to support revenue and market share growth. As Vice President of Marketing at Paya, Brent leads all aspects of brand, product, and partner marketing, as well as industry and technology community engagement and evangelism. Prior to joining Paya, Brent spent six years at Verifone, most recently as Chief of Staff and Head of Marketing Strategy, serving under the Regional President of the Americas. Brent's experience includes progressive leadership roles in marketing and business development with Verifone, VeriSign, and Microsoft. Brent began his career as a web application engineer supporting the development of e-billing solutions for the wireless industry. He holds a BS from Armstrong Atlantic State University, an MBA from Georgia Southern University, and an MSCS in data science from Kennesaw State University. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brent. Hey, Delaney, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and thank you all for joining this afternoon. Uh, my name is Brent Phillips. I'm the VP of Marketing at Paya. And I'd also like to thank RevIO for the opportunity to speak on this topic today of user-centric design and how it how it drives uh, digital user experiences. Um, one thing I do want to talk about just briefly, because it may be unusual for a marketer to be speaking about something like uh, user-centered design, uh, that topic often comes up in you know, product development discussions or in um, user experience research discussions. Uh, as Delaney mentioned, uh, I started my career as a web application developer and helped build e-billing systems. And so I was a practitioner of user-centered design for some time. Uh, in fact, uh, for the session today, I'll talk a little bit about uh, one of my projects as a case study, um, some lessons learned about how the process or how our approach uh, didn't quite um, you know, meet the bar that we were trying to reach. Additionally, in, in addition to my duties uh, as uh, head of marketing at Paya, I also am an adjunct professor at Kennesaw State University, which is a local state school in Georgia, and I lecture on interaction design, uh, which is closely related to user-centric design. And uh, so I've kept up with the practice and I, I've uh, been really excited to see how it's evolved in our industry. And then last, as a marketer, um, customer experience is important to, to me, uh, as it is to all of you as, as business leaders. Uh, we think about you know, customer experience really is, is what we aim to improve continuously to make sure that, that we're retaining customers as well as differentiating and attracting new customers, um, which is, is certainly important to us at Paya. Um, so with that in mind, um, you know, the presentation today will be just a, a bit academic. Um, but hopefully will also be thought provoking, right? In terms of how user-centered design can play into your product and service strategy. Uh, here's the agenda. Uh, we're, we've got a lot of parts here, but hopefully it will move pretty quickly. Um, the goal really is to get you oriented to user-centric design first. And then I'll talk about an example from the early days of e-billing where our design approach, as I mentioned, wasn't so successful, although it was well-intentioned. And this was the project that I participated in uh, for another company. And th from there, we'll take a look at digital payments um, you know, and what digital payments today means for ISVs and MSPs and then other digital experiences. Uh, and then I'll get into Paya's approach to user-centered design as it relates to integrated payments and some of the value we deliver as part of that effort. And then last, I'll have some uh, recommendations and a summary. Um, before we jump into the topic, let me talk a little bit about Paya. Uh, so if you don't know us, we're an integrated payments and commerce enablement provider it serves a variety of mid-market verticals, 
And today we're processing over 35 billion in annual transaction volume, which makes us a top 20 e-commerce provider in the US market. We're actually ranked number six, and that's a very exciting place to be. And we're very proud of that. Uh, we're headquartered in Atlanta and we have regional offices across the US. And as, the fourth, as of the fourth quarter, excuse me, of 2020, um, we are now publicly traded on NASDAQ under the symbol PAYA, P-A-Y-A. As, as a payment service provider, I also want to stress this. Um, we've been successful not only because of the performance of our technology that we make available to our partners, but also through our industry expertise and our approach to partnerships uh, directly. And we really pride ourselves on our ability to support partners end to end. And so this means, you know, starting from an integration to deployment, uh, to providing ongoing payment management, as well as ongoing technical and strategic support. And to that last part, you know, our partner success is, is our success. And so we strive to help them grow their business any way we can. Um, and with respect to our host, by the way, all of us at Paya are very proud to serve as the integrated payments partner for RevIO. So very exciting partnership that we are, we are just uh, um, beginning our journey and uh, looking forward to working together uh, with Rev um, in, you know, on, on various projects in the future. Well, with that in mind, let's jump into the, the material. So three learning objectives that we'll tease out through the course of the session today. Um, the first is really uh, looking at integrated digital payments as, a, as defining a user experience and how they contribute to a better, a better excuse me, overall customer experience, right? And so there's things that we can think about from a user-centered design perspective to influence these things. Um, next, we'll talk about some best practices for user-centered design. So I'll talk about the process methodology, and then I'll talk about how, how Paya uh, approaches user-centered user design and, uh, and, and show how some of that is translated into value for our partners. And then like any, any, uh, any good slide for um, a specific subject, terminology is always important um, in, in any industry. There are a lot of terms, abbreviations, acronyms, et cetera. So I wanted to level set a bit on things that we'll talk about today. Uh, and by the way, um, some of these have their own fields of discipline outright. So I'm giving you somewhat of a pragmatic perspective based on the context of today's discussion. Uh, but the first one is customer experience that we see denoted by CX almost everywhere these days. And the way we like to think about it in this field is it's the, it's the perception of the total of all the interactions that a customer has with your business. And whether it's B2B or B2C, it can really be talked about in the same way, right? So you think about all the touch points your business has with a customer, all the places a customer can interact with you. It's that net perception that, that accrues over time. And you measure customer experience through things like satisfaction scores. Uh, things like net promoter score, like whether or not a customer would recommend you or whether they may do business with you again. And what comes to mind, um, you know, as I think about this from a tactical perspective is the Amazon ratings, right? When you're buying something from Amazon, you have the, the five stars that you can, up to five stars you can provide to a vendor. Uh, and, and those vendors really live and die by those ratings. And so uh, that's what we think about from a customer experience perspective. Uh, as the building blocks of customer experience, we think about user experience denoted by UX. Um, and this is similar, but it's, it's more of the user's perception of those interactions at a product service application or interface level. And the relationship is, you know, you think about a number of different user experiences accruing to the customer experience overall. And so when you think about that, um, you know, you can have a favorable customer experience in general. And, and maybe one bad user experience. And the, the degree of, of bad varies, but you know, if all of, the, all of the other user experiences are strong, one bad one's not gonna necessarily hurt the customer experience or the customer perception of your brand. Um, but the opposite is not true. If you have a horrible customer experience, um, finding one positive user experience doesn't necessarily swing uh, the pendulum in your favor. Um, so it's something to think about in terms of levers and in terms of drivers of overall uh, positive customer experience and customer excuse me, perception. Next is user-centered design, which is the topic of the session today. Um, this is really a design methodology. Um, and it's, it's an approach uh, similar to almost agile where you're taking iterative steps through a sequence of events to go from um, sort of scoping of, of, uh, of a product opportunity or an interface or workflow opportunity and taking it through to fruition. So it's iterative, it's incremental, 
And the key here is to have the users at the center of the entire process. And, and that's really what makes it unique. Um, and by the way, that's easier said than done. So I'll speak a little bit about that later when I talk about Pia's approach. But in terms of what the process itself looks like, and I borrowed this from the Interaction Design uh, Organization, um, there's, there's a series of steps. And the idea is sort of scoping all the way through to uh, development and testing. And you see, the, you see the labels empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And it's this concept of design thinking. And the, basically what's happening is, is the researcher will focus on interviews, observation, um, it's kind of scoping of the problem in the empathize stage. So we're starting to understand user behavior. We're starting to understand how they operate, how they work, and what tasks they need to complete. When we move from empathize to define, we're starting to look at personas. So different users interact with the system in different ways and may have different needs, or they may have different processes altogether. And so as you're thinking about application development or you're thinking about new interface development, you need to understand how different users may come at that interface in different ways, what their pain points are, what they're trying to, to accomplish. From there, we move into ideation, where you're working iteratively again with your users, um, trying to understand how to accomplish tasks in the most efficient way possible. Um, so you're, you're, um, you're diverging on ideas, you're converging on ideas, and you're ultimately doing a lot of whiteboarding, note-taking, validating of the definition and empathizing phase, and moving into some sort of prototype. Um, beyond that. And once you get to prototyping, obviously you want to test that again with your users. And so ultimately you're going through this iterative cycle of, um, you know, development until you get to a V1 of a product. Uh, and again, if you're familiar with ag agile methodologies, this is something that's uh, very similar in terms of the, the iterative nature. Um, there's another view that I wanted to show. One of my colleagues sent me this and it's, it's probably best for the visual folks in the audience. Um, but it accomplishes the same, the intent is to accomplish or convey the same information, right? So uh, if you look at the top, you know, you've got an iceberg and the, in, the intent is to show that um, with a, a very strong visual interface or a strong application, all of the due diligence and all of the work behind the scenes to make sure that that is as effective as possible at supporting a task or a, a workflow, right? So your strategy is sort of your empathizing and definition phase. Um, scoping is really getting into the ideation of what you will do and won't do. Structure and skeleton start to talk about the, the prototyping and testing. And ultimately, you get to a very strong end product that, that your users will be able to leverage and benefit from. And what's interesting about this, by the way, is that um, the, the, the process is similar, again, to um, you know, this agile methodology. And ultimately, we're, we're also working on a journey, not a destination. And so you have to think about this as kind of a continuous process, because once you get to that, that final stage or once you get to that final release or at V1, um, there's always opportunity to continue improving as business needs change, as users needs change, and so on. And as we think about all the various places that we as consumers interact with software these days, um, all of the expectations of of those different um, interactions accrue to expectations that we have about any one of those applications, if that makes sense. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a second, but at the end of the day, um, there's always gonna be a continuous bar uh, being raised around um, the, the improvement and efficiency of workflows that we develop. All right, so I've got a little bit of extra credit and this is getting more into um, some methodology and some terminology, um, concepts that are related to laws and principles with user-centric design. And there's a number of these in the field of, of research for user-centered design, but I'm only teasing out a few uh, because these um, demonstrate some of the guiding principles that we'll talk about uh, today and will be uh, directly applicable to the case study. So the first one is Jacob's Law, and this is what I was referencing just a second ago on the previous slide about this continuous bar being raised. And the notion here is really interesting. It's, it's this idea that your users really don't spend a lot of time on your site, um, but they're spending a lot of time on, on other sites and on other applications. And the net of those digital experiences are solidifying the expectation they have for your site. And so uh, if an expectation is, is, 
is not met, or if there's something off about the way your site operates relative to others, it stands out more clearly now in the minds of users. And uh, you know, one example comes to mind from personal experiences. I, I work with a number of banks, and a couple of the banks have extremely unique password requirements. And it drives me crazy because other sites have, you know, you can use whatever characters, whatever combination you want. Um, on, on, in one of these particular banks, certain special characters aren't used and they happen to be special characters that I prefer. So uh, the expectation is not quite met. Um, and so, so it's, it's standing out, right? And that's something we have to be mindful of as we design our interfaces because uh, we wanna make sure that we're, we're thinking about standardization. We're thinking about um, overall user expectation and staying on top of it in a way that's continuously meeting or exceeding our customers' expectations. The next one is aesthetic usability effect. And I love this one because it, it was something that really applied to the case study that I'll talk about. Um, at the end of the day, it, it really refers to a notion of uh, if a user believes or if a user perceives an interface to be strong, aesthetically strong, they will believe that the application is easier to use. And you know whether or not it, it's it's the reality, um, the belief will be there. So it's in our best interest as uh, product developers, especially ISVs, you know, putting software out online, SaaS-based applications. It's in our best interest to make sure that the interfaces are visually strong, and and the user's perception will follow that the application is easy to use, even if it's not quite up to where you want it to be in in all cases. Um, last is the Doherty threshold, um, and this is another one that's that's really cool from my perspective. And it talks about productivity between human and computer interaction, and and this gets into the weeds a little bit. It's not something we necessarily think about until it's happening to us. And the notion here is that the the highest peak of productivity is when each between the user and the system, the response is under 400 milliseconds, and that is extremely fast. It's near real time. And if we're, if we're looking at um, you know, a web application in particular and there's any, anything lagging to like a second or longer, uh, it starts to feel like latency and it starts to feel like the application is not responsive. And so application developers are, are putting cues on screens, you know, your little spinning clock or your dial that's showing progress. Progress meters are very important because it accommodates, it, it addresses this threshold for users who otherwise would, would begin to grow impatient. Uh, if they're not seeing something immediately happening on the screen. So even, even if it's a prompt that says we're waiting on something to happen, uh, that's helpful. All right, so we just covered user-centric design. We covered some terminology and we covered some, um, some process overview. And, and I'd like to pause here and just do a very quick poll. Um, we've got two questions to, to find out if any of you are using these methodologies today and then to what extent you find value in these methodologies. So let me turn it over to Delaney. You all should be seeing something pop up on your screen now. All right, so it looks like we've got um, some process being used, so somewhat, all right? And then some are saying that it's part of their development methodology. Okay, that's great, so five respondents, cool. All right, thanks for the feedback. And we've got one more question coming here.
All right, good. So uh, four responses um, and some of you think it's valuable. Uh, looks like one of you thinks it's very valuable. So good. Um, and for those of you on the call who did not vote, I will try to convince you as to its value. All right, so let's move on. Uh, and thank you for the responses, by the way. All right, so let's take a look at this case study now. So as I mentioned, um, I was a, a web uh, application developer some years ago, and I helped build an e-bill presentment and payment solution called Speed Bills. Uh, it was for another company. Uh, but to set the stage, it was the early 2000s, so quite some time ago. And we were working for a late stage startup that supported uh, tier two and tier three wireless carriers, so regional wireless carriers with uh, a billing system and billing and CRM. And we were at a point where we wanted to start adding uh, differentiated solutions to our platform and helping our carrier partners further differentiate for themselves. Uh, they were very interested in standing out um, from one another, as well as competing with the tier ones. So customer service was a, a, a cornerstone of their, of their business strategy to drive subscriber adoption. Uh, and as e-care and e-billing started to come on the scene, they thought that that would be a good opportunity to to, to leverage, right, to, to drive that um, a differentiated value for their customer base. Uh, longer term, they saw an opportunity to move everything to digital, in fact. And so there was some, some notion to, you know, reduce or remove the, the, the printing of bills altogether. Uh, and so that was sort of the long-term goal. But as we, as we talked to them, we really got excited about the, the opportunity because um, we were interested in, in, again, creating differentiated value for ourselves as a billing provider. And so our focus was heavily on interaction or interface design. And the goal was to come up with just a bleeding edge application that everybody would just you know, die to use. We, we really thought we were gonna come up with this immersive experience, uh, even gamify the interface to some degree. And so the approach we took was to, to work with a technology called Flash by a company uh, called Macromedia. And if you're not familiar with Macromedia, they were pioneers in web streaming and web animation technology in the late 90s, early 2000s. They were subsequently bought by Adobe. And for years, their technology was the de facto animation technology for the web. And so we, we had this technology. We had some, we had some um, designers come over from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, we had um, engineers from Macromedia. Uh, helping us build this um, due to the complexity of the application as well as the volume of data we were managing through through their their tool set uh, they were really interested in our work as a case study to prove out the capacity and capability of their tech so they were involved uh, we had a lot of good talent working on this and the goal was to create something that was unique and had really never been seen before in our space and so we emphasized the interactive and immersive experience uh, while also providing a secondary dual interface with that was just a standard HTML login. And the functionality that uh, we provided, similar to what you might see today, you could view your bill, you could pay with credit card or debit card. We weren't doing ACH at the time, uh, but you can also look at up to six months of, of bill history, and then you could download all of it, right? So we were feeding down a download capability for up to six months of call detail record. So you can imagine the complexity of, of the data management as well as, as um, the, the complexity of the application functionality. And so all of it came together into what we, we, we deemed as a very um, leading edge uh, application in the e-billing space. So uh, yeah, we said, this was the aesthetic usability rule, by the way, I, I, I wanted to call that out uh, because we were really focusing on the interface itself. And we like to say that it was on steroids. Um, it was again, sort of bleeding edge and it was the first of its kind in, in that category of business. And then what we observed and what we found out was, was very eye-opening. So carriers loved it initially. We would showcase it, we would take it out in sort of the test environment. Uh, we would market it to, to all of our operator partners who were really excited about it. Um, there was an 80% adoption rate over time. And they loved the fact that there was this strong aesthetic. They really felt like it was unique. We could white label it. So they were excited about creating their own branded version of this application and then making it available to their subscribers. Some of the users we talked to also loved it for the same reasons. They looked at the application, they thought the application was amazing and they thought, wow, this thing is gonna be fantastic. We'll be able to have this interactive immersive experience and take care of our bills at the same time. The reality was though, that there was a very low subscriber adoption rate. 
uh, despite focused marketing with partners. We were working with our partners directly on marketing campaigns. Uh, we were educating the, the partner sales staff and customer support staff, but also uh, marketing to the end users uh, to help them understand how the application worked and what they could do with it. And at the end, we really never got past, uh, on average, a 3% uh, adoption rate in total. Uh, some carriers were higher, some were lower, but at the end of the day, it was about 3%. And then over time, it died off. Uh, and it did have a negative impact to the user experience that, that ultimately accrued, in fact, to some impact to customer experience because you imagine logging in to pay your bill, the next thing you do if the application is not working is you know, maybe try a few things, but then also call in. And so you know, call center calls spiked, uh, and then the system just didn't quite work the way we expected it to. And the reason why is this. Um, what we built is on the left, metaphorically speaking, but on the right is what we needed. Right? We had this great advanced functionality, especially for the interface itself, um, but what we really needed was simplicity and trustworthy technology. You know, so at the end of the day, the solution complexity was the barrier to adoption. Uh, it ultimately missed the mark on the user experience uh, in spite of being focused on the interaction design. And what I mean by that is you know, when people were logging into the system, you know, they're, coming from a, they're coming from their home ISP or internet service provider bandwidth wasn't as fast back then. Uh, and so latency was, was a big problem. Um, we also had uh, some requirements of the browsers. You had to set certain, um, certain settings to, to turn on capabilities to support Flash, um, you know, cookies and scripts and things of that nature. And overall consumer digital literacy was much lower. Um, none of us were as savvy about web technology back then as we are today. And so we were, we were dealing with a learning curve that we weren't prepared to address. Uh, and then browser compatibility in general, and even having the dual interface was confusing for users. Um, and so, you know, especially the latency, uh, calling back to our, our principles, uh, we totally broke the Doherty threshold, right? So because of the bandwidth issues, um, people were waiting multiple seconds or longer for, for a simple action to take place on the screen, uh, you know, because of bandwidth issues. Other factors that were happening at the time, and I'll contrast that to, to today in the next slide. You know, it was the early days of e-commerce. Consumers were very wary of, of using cards online. You know, the early adopters were starting to do it, but uh, mainstream wasn't quite taking off yet. Uh, and so we felt like we were ahead of the curve in some respects. Um, and, and really in hindsight, we realized that we had built an application that was ahead of its time uh, to the detriment of, of uh, our goals, obviously. Um, because an application would, like that would work fine today. Uh, but digital literacy, as I mentioned, was much lower. And what we really needed was simplicity. And at the time, uh, also, there were a lot of e-billers starting to emerge. You know, banks were getting into the space. There was a class of operator, a class of business provider called an aggregator that was trying to create a portal. You know, they were creating portal strategies to get between the brands and consumers. Uh, their goal was to monetize the service, but also to monetize ads and data. Uh, and then you had specialized e-billing providers uh, who were getting involved and in going to the brands directly to try to build out the, the capabilities. And they were all doing it better. They were taking, uh, taking a very simplistic, pragmatic ap approach to the interface design and really solving for some of the things that we didn't think about solving for. Last was digital infrastructure. Um, you know, again, very, very limited bandwidth. Um, the connectivity of the ISPs was just getting built out uh, into what we you know, see now is just full national coverage. The wireless uh, networks were fragmented. There were five or six distinct network technologies in place. And so mobility uh, and interoperability for mobile was very limited. Roaming was just starting to, to evolve in a good way. And it just wasn't uh, to, the, to the degree of rigor uh, that we have now. And so let's jump ahead. Let's talk about uh, trends today. I think the first one that's obvious for all of us is we're ubiquitously connected. You know, the networks uh, are, are such that we can just tap in anytime we need to. We've got our mobile phones, mobile devices. Uh, we can get to any information we need and we can get to any data we need pretty much from anywhere uh, in the U.S. And, and likely in the world. Next is that digital payments are expected, right? You just, wherever you go, uh, anytime you're on a service provider site, you expect to have some degree of payment capability. Um, you have uh, an expectation of self-care, account administration, uh, being able to take care of things for yourself without calling in or contacting the business. 
Um, and this is true of B2B or B2C, really. You just uh, expect that those capabilities are in place. And this is for digital experiences in general, I think. Um, next is the increase in digital literacy. Uh, I'm a card carrying member of Generation X, and we lived through the transition from analog to digital. So I remember the days where the internet didn't exist, you know, in, in any kind of scaled way, um, and where cell phones were really just literally for voice calls. And, you know, the generation behind mine, uh, you know, grow up, grew up not knowing what it was like to, to not have the internet and to not have cell phones and tablets at their disposal. And so the sophistication of the user is getting extremely strong from a digital literacy perspective. And so the expectations are getting higher. Uh, next, we see the acceleration of digital transformation. And this is with front end, um, you know, digital experiences, as well as the back end for operational automation and efficiency, like leveraging technology to improve the business. Um, this is not new for, for many of us, uh, but at the same time, it's something that is, is also a journey. And as um, you know, companies have started to adopt uh, or increasingly adopt technology, um, it's, it's uh, snowballing. So as more technology is adopted, more services and capabilities are enabled, and then they look for ways to scale and gain efficiency. And it's just this continuous cycle, I think. And as we looked at the pandemic last year, uh, that certainly helped expedite some of the acceleration um, where uh, especially like e-services started to emerge very quickly to accommodate social distancing requirements and things like that. Um, but this was definitely a trend that was already in place and continues even now that we're, we're, we're post-pandemic. Payment innovation, I think, is a given. Um, you know, we used to write checks. Uh, now everything is, is card or digital, uh, which is very exciting. New payment schemas are, are coming online very quickly. Uh, we can pretty much send funds anywhere. Uh, really at the click of a button. So, you know, companies like PayPal, Venmo, Paya, you know, we're, we're enabling uh, payments um, in very flexible and omni-channel ways to accommodate the expectations of users. And the last is consumerization of IT. And this is an idea that really describes the, the, all the experiences that we as consumers have. You know, we're the lowest common denominator of an economy. And all of our experiences with consumer applications are now being brought into the business environment. And so our, our, the influence we get on our applications personally are now what inform our filters when we see a business application. And so the business applications um, need to mature. And our goal really is to think about um, those same standards and, and expectations that go into the consumer product design for interfaces in particular and workflows. We're, we're wanting to do the same and we should think about doing the same for business applications so that the expectations are met. And by the way, this is back to Jacob's Law. So that was the first principle we talked about earlier. Now I'm gonna shift gears. And for this last section, I'm gonna talk a little bit about integrated payments at Paya. Um, oh, no, I won't, excuse me. I do wanna talk about the impact to ISVs and MSPs first, just to recap that last section. I think the first thing that we want to think about is that digital experiences are vital, right, to promoting a positive customer experience. They're expected and they, they are expected and then the expectations users have of those experiences are getting higher. Cornerstone of those experiences really are self-care, e-billing, e-payments, um, all of the things that a, a user, business user or consumer can do at your site to take care of their own account. Um, even things like, um, you know, scheduling a payment or setting up recurring payments or making a payment, those types of things or account management, all are important. And as we think about user-centric design, they accelerate the optimization of those experiences. And so it's important to fold them into your processes so that you're continuously improving and continuously meeting or exceeding, exceeding the expectations of your users. All right, now on to integrated payments. So I'll briefly touch on this slide. This is really just the drivers for why integrated payments are, are uh, taking off and why they're so important. Um, and this is really just to, to contrast in particular to a standalone model. Uh, when you think about businesses today, especially the ISVs, MSPs that have a, a set of services or software that they provide, um, it, it's more beneficial to fold a payment experience in to the experience that they provide rather than providing two separate silos of technology to a customer, now you have um, two, two independent backends integrated together uh, to help the business run more efficiently. And so we're seeing a, a greater demand for that. So that's, that's why our platform 
um, is, is so um, designed to be so flexible from an API perspective. And I'll speak to, to that more in a few minutes. Omnichannel payment solutions, right? So um, the expectation of all users really is that they want to pay when and how they want to and through whatever means they, they're most comfortable with. So for some people that's in person, uh, some people that's a kiosk, some people that's an IVR cutting a check, it may be online. And so based on the needs of our partners and what their customers expect, um, we need to accommodate those capabilities um, and be ready for new methods of payment. You know, contactless, for example, card not present. Those are all things that we're seeing uh, more commonly these days with digital wallets and tap and go, NFC technology and so on. Uh, and so it's, it's something that we wanna be mindful of. Verticalization of payments really speaks to, you know, a specialized payment instruments, you know, stored value cards, um, you know, healthcare payment cards. Um, think about your, your college student with their, their student card to pay for things at the bookstore, at the cafeteria. And even, um, you know, certain needs like, um, you know, we say, see here, recurring payments, uh, integrated invoicing and accounting, simplified pricing, service fees. That's another one, right? Where companies or certain verticals may be accustomed to service fees or convenience fees. So being able to accommodate needs like that. Uh, is, is where we see a tremendous opportunity from an integrated payments perspective. Security, privacy, and compliance, I think, is a given. Uh, as, as much as the technology advances, um, you know, the, the hackers um, get just as sophisticated, and so there's, there's always a race to be more secure and more PCI compliant. Um, as it relates to PCI compliance, um, many merchants um, certainly want to uh, manage that as best they can and reduce scope. Uh, which is something else we're also mindful of to look for ways we can help do that in, in certain cases. And then the last goes back to the influence of consumer tech on, on business technology, right? So I mentioned that before, and that's something we're definitely seeing in our space. In terms of integrating payments at Paya, this is, this is really how we think about it. Um, there's a, a number of ways we provide integrations, um, but at the, at the start of any partner relationship, the first thing we do is, is uh, have a discovery uh, series of discovery meetings, and we have dedicated integration support to help a partner determine the best integration for their business. In some cases, it's, it's a much lighter uh, type of integration where we're providing a hosted payment page or maybe form modules that they can embed into something that they manage. Uh, in both of those cases, you know, Paya is accommodating and supporting the PCI compliance um, on behalf of the business. Um, other times it's a direct integration that's much more robust and that speaks to the interface integration that I spoke about earlier, uh, where we're really providing connectivity into a, a workflow that makes it more seamless for the user. And so we, we have these uh, discovery meetings, we determine the best path to follow. Uh, we provide you know, si significant levels of documentation and support. Uh, you know, our platform is API first and we, we really um, are as flexible as we need to be to support the, the expectations and needs of, of any particular partner. Um, I talk about our platform being modular and extensible. You know, we say service-oriented architecture. Um, we have a lot of tools that support integration and testing uh, as part of that platform. And we also um, offer cloud-based EMV hardware certification uh, if the business needs it. What's great about this is the MV terminal is, is a physical terminal that sits you know, at a store location. It's talking to Pia Connect, our platform through the cloud, which is talking to the ECR or the, the cash register technology. And the two never really connect in the store. And so in and of itself helps reduce PCI scope um, to our comment earlier about um, you know, managing that down. And it's a very robust and flexible technology. And so we, we try to accommodate um, new functionality as quickly as we can based on the needs of our partners through this architecture strategy. In terms of integration flexibility, I've already spoken to these. Um, and so it, it really is in our best interest, again, to meet the partner where they are in terms of what they want for their business and how they want to deploy payments. And so we work with them individually to determine the best path forward. In terms of value, by the way, so we, we tend to think of value that we deliver on the user-centered design perspective. Um, in, in, uh, in terms of back office and front end. And so on the next couple of slides, I'll walk through both and give you a little bit of idea of what we do and, and how we think about value delivery from that perspective. So back office experiences, so going back to our design methodology, the persona that we think about um, is an administrator or administrators. And they're typically dealing with operations or customer care, making sure they're taking care of um, you know, um, internal stakeholders as well as the customers that may call in. 
and the experiences that we really um, strive to, to solve for, um, the one I mentioned before is a seamless interface. So leveraging our APIs to fold payment capabilities into the workflows that an administrator is already used to. Um, this provides a single point of entry for them. Uh, it reduces the amount of training that really has to happen. We're reducing the number of siloed technologies that they have to interact with. And ultimately by doing that, we're giving them better user experience. Uh, and we're also uh, looking at workflow efficiency. This is extremely important in terms of overall productivity. Um, beyond that, we have enhanced reporting and analytics, right? So bringing more data fluidity to the back end, and so that we're getting, um, uh, you know, a, like um, reporting uh, that provides a, a total picture of the business uh, by having those technologies working together. And then when you do this and you you integrate systems and you automate processes, you have an overall reduction in errors. Um, and this is not anything that's intentional or due to negligence. It's really just an issue of uh, human computer interaction, interaction is really, um, you know, there's a, there's a degree of expectation that some errors will occur. And so by having the systems connected, you're removing dual entry of data uh, and you eliminate some of those error opportunities. And what this all accrues to from a value perspective uh, is efficiency for sure. Uh, we're really looking for back office efficiency and productivity and then responsiveness. And this is, um, you know, the system being responsive to the business as well as um, you know, the client service teams being responsive to the customers, right? So those are the, those are the anchor points that we really think about. In terms of the uh, end user experience, our persona is um, you know, the, the final end user of our services, our combined services. They're interested in payments and they're interested in self-care. And so the experiences we think about here kind of echoing what we talked about earlier in those drivers for integrated payments, right? So intuitive interfaces and workflows. We want to think about efficiency, aesthetic, and ease of use, right? So anything that we provide as an endpoint, we want to make sure we're supporting those tenants as part of the design process. Always on, meaning that the system really is never down. Um, you know, users can access it when and how they want to. Log in, check their account, check their balance, pay a bill, schedule a payment, what have you. It's all very important from the user experience perspective. Omnichannel access, again, those touch points, those ways that a user wants to interact with your business from a payment perspective, we wanna make sure that we are accommodating all of those that the partner needs for their business objectives. And then last, flexibility of payment methods, right? So this is check, credit, debit, any payment method that they wanna use, um, we wanna make sure that we accommodate. Um, you know, when we see a lot of um, innovation in this space with mobile wallets, for example, so tap and go, um, we're also seeing um, one that we're watching are trends around, you know, virtual currency, um, something that we're keeping an eye on in terms of broad adoption. And as I, as I mentioned, in terms of our innovation strategy, you know, that may end up being something that we, we accommodate as part of our ongoing um, business model to support our partners. Then in terms of the focus, really, uh, for all of this, it accrues to customer experience overall and then revenue assurance. And the tenant here, the belief here is that as we, as we enable all of these capabilities, we're, we're engaging the customer in such a way that they uh, have, have an improved opportunity and propensity to pay on time um, and pay their bills in general, right? So overall, we're, we're hoping to accelerate revenue assurance, um, you know, reduce calls into the call center, uh, providing that self-care that they need to take care of the accounts that uh, you provide to them. So in terms of Pi's principled approach to user-centered design, we focus on the customer journey. So again, uh, ease of use, aesthetic, and efficiency. Those are the three tenants we think about. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's not always easy to get the users into every stage of, of development, but we, we think about those three tenants as we optimize workflows and as we introduce new workflows. We also take feedback from our call centers. Uh, we take feedback from customers in different channels. And we use that all as a basis for developing workflows that uh, we try to optimize on their behalf, both from uh, the back office as well as the front end experience. And with respect to integration, we think about overall workflow impact. So we don't wanna introduce our, our capabilities into a workflow in an unnatural way. We wanna make sure that it fits into the business model and the working model of the partner so that it's as fluid as possible and as intuitive as possible for the users. Um, develop with standard tools and libraries. So what's great about, you know, the development technology that's out there is that there, there are a lot of standards-based technologies that support kind of rich interaction design today. So things like Bootstrap, which is a framework for front-end development, 
um, different JavaScript libraries, you know, jQuery, Vue, Ember, React, all designed with best practices for interface design in mind. And so if your developers are using these tools, then you're already a good step in the right direction for standardizing on those experiences. Leverage domain experts, that's something we do. Uh, we've had consultants come in occasionally and help with, with UI design. And we've recently just hired our first uh, user experience design researcher to help us with uh, interface and workflow optimization. And last is a continuous improvement. I think I said this earlier, you know, it's, it's about the journey, not the destination in this case. And so as user expectations change, as business needs change, and as um, you know, the, the system needs to change, um, we look at ways to always improve the process and the process flows and the interfaces that we provide. All right, so summarizing, wrapping it all up. Um, I think it's safe to say that, you know, the positive digital experiences are drivers for a positive customer experience. So I think as, as ISVs and MSPs go, um, it's in our best interest to focus on these and really optimize them as best we can. Um, for all of us, self-care, e-billing, e-payments are a must, right? We've got to have those capabilities in place and we need to be meeting or exceeding the expectations of the users. Leverage user-centered design to optimize those experiences, absolutely. So um, think about the experience that you deliver today. Um, use, and I'll talk about some steps in a second as to how to evaluate them or some ideas, but you know, make sure that you're, you're getting the most out of those investments and that your users are getting the most out of those investments. So look at the usage rate, look at abandonment rates, um, use your web analytics to your advantage to understand how your applications or e-care is being used today and, and see what you can do to improve the processes and evangelize those services as a differentiator. Orient design to user value, so efficiency, ease of use, and aesthetic. And last, you know, consider how to incorporate user-centered design into core product dev, right? So I think that's something that we can all be mindful of, especially with, you know, SaaS-based applications, right? Um, you know, the web experience is very common these days, and so the, the user experiences are important and user expectations continue to rise. And so we want to we wanna make sure we optimize where we can for both the e-care capabilities as well as uh, core application development. And then where to start? So if you're interested in, in leveraging uh, user-centered design or getting incorporating it into your own strategies, um, you know, customer surveys are great. You know, ask users about uh, an experience or experiences with your technology. A site usability audit. So maybe having professionals come in and look at your application or your site to, to let you know where you might have opportunities for improvement. Find your champion internally. You know, find a product owner or a designer who wants to invest time in researching and helping internally evangelize the methodologies that you can start to adopt as part of your practice. University interns, um, you know, my, in my, my program at Kennesaw State, we have a number of students that are readily available to go do work uh, and they're cheap labor and they're very passionate about the, the work they do. So a great opportunity to get some on, on the job training as well as help a business solve for some of these issues. Start with a pilot, right? Get into a small project, test the waters and look at an optimization process and see how well it goes. And then take that and extrapolate it to other applications or other uh, interfaces you're working on. And then communities of practice. Um, the Interaction Design Association has a huge chapter in Atlanta. Um, there are chapters all over the country. Um, find yours and, and get involved. Um, there's a lot of practitioners and a lot of best practices out there that, that can help you potentially with your business. And then the last one is come see us at the RevIO User Conference, August 25th to the 27th in Atlanta. Um, we will be there, we will have a booth and we'll be happy to talk to you about integrated payments or our approach to user-centered design as part of our, our innovation efforts. Last, if you wanna get in touch, uh, my email address is brent.phillips at pi.com. LinkedIn is jbrentonphillips. And with that, I wanna thank you very much for your time. That was great, Brent. Thank you so much for your time. Before we do begin the Q&A portion of the presentation, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today and review a few housekeeping items. The first reminder is that we're always interested in topics that you'd like to learn more about, so please submit your topic ideas in the Q&A box. In addition, the full webinar recording will be emailed to you within two days. Lastly, if you've submitted any questions during the presentation that don't get addressed in the live Q&A, we will be following up with you individually via email. Now I'd like to ask a few questions from our audience. Can you use user-centered design methodologies with Agile? 
Absolutely. Uh, and, and you think about agile is, is really um, an iterative product development process. And you can use um, user-centered design to define what you're developing. So they can be completely independent processes, but I see user-centered design as feeding into the overall agile process. It's challenging to get constant user input for product development. How have you overcome this? So for us, it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, focusing on those tenants that I mentioned, right? So efficiency, aesthetic, and ease of use are, are really our starting points when, we, when we're looking to optimize an interface or a workflow. You know, one example I can think of is, is when we automated our, uh, something called a boarding process, uh, which used to take a lot of time and paperwork and, and signature ink, ink signature on paper. Um, we were able to digitize that entire experience and we took what what once was a you know several day process down to um, you know a several hour process. From there, we leverage data from our call center, uh, and we do talk to users on occasion uh, as well. And we try to use that collective set of inputs to help us determine how best to optimize any or all of the applications in a, in a given you know set of workflows. Will Pia be attending Revio's client summit in August? Yes, we will. In fact, uh, August 25th and 27th, we will have a booth there and I believe we'll be presenting as well. And can you briefly describe the combined Revio and Pia solution? Absolutely. So if you think about, um, you know, Revio's um, set of services, right, uh, e-billing and e-care services, we provide the payment capability behind that. So as you, um, you know, look to make a payment uh, through the capabilities that Revio provides. We are on the back end through a very robust API integrated offering to process that payment for you. Well, that looks like those are all the questions we have today. Brent, thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Delaney. And thanks everybody for your time today.